icy water floods the main deck and in a matter of 30 seconds the ferry lists 30 degrees to port. In the late 1970s, Townsend Torreson commissioned the design and construction of three new identical ferries for its Dover to Calais route and took delivery in 1980. The Spirit class ships were named Spirit of Free Enterprise, Herald of Free Enterprise and Pride of Free Enterprise. Herald of Free Enterprise entered service on the 29th of May 1980. A triple screw row row or roll on roll off passenger and vehicle ferry built in Bremerhaven, Germany. The ship was powered by three 8,000 horsepower, 12 cylinder diesel engines, allowing for a top speed of 22 knots. To remain competitive with other ferry operators on the route, Townsend Torreson commissioned the Herald's design for fast loading and unloading and for rapid acceleration. The Herald had eight decks labeled A to H from top to bottom with decks D, E and G serving as vehicle decks. E-deck was the upper vehicle deck accessed through a weathertight door at the bow and an open portal at the stern. G-deck was the main vehicle deck with watertight doors at the bow and stern. The ship had clamshell bow doors with two panels that spread open sideways instead of a visor door that raises upwards. The clamshell doors were below the bow making it difficult for someone at the bridge to see if they were open or closed. At Dover and Calais, vehicles could be loaded and unloaded onto E and G decks simultaneously using two ramps, one on top of the other, called double deck link spans. The lower ramp led to the main G deck and the upper ramp to E deck. The Herald had an enclosed superstructure above the bulkhead deck for the passengers. For safety and stability, it had weathertight doors to prevent water pouring in from the side exposed to the weather and it had watertight doors and bulkheads in place where water could potentially accumulate on either side. The bow had watertight inner and outer doors while the stern had only an outer watertight door. The bow doors were hydraulically operated opening by swinging out to either side and being stowed against the side of the ship. The inner bow doors acted as an additional barrier against water entering the main vehicle deck. They open by tilting down and closed onto a watertight seal in the bulkhead, which is a reinforced cross section of the ship. The Herald was well supplied with life-saving equipment and the crew trained for emergency procedures to evacuate the ship within 30 minutes. The Herald not only conformed with, but carried equipment in excess of statutory requirements. The Herald and its two sister ships were built for the Dover to Calais run. They were fitted with powerful engines. The Roro ferries were capable of rapid acceleration to make the channel crossing at high speed. They were also designed to disembark their passengers and vehicles rapidly, then quickly embark passengers and vehicles for the return journey. After the ships went into service, Townsend Torreson was awarded a new route between Dover and the Belgian port of Seeburger. The three Spirit class ships took on this new route. But the link span used for loading at Seeburger was not designed for the Spirit class vessels. It had a single deck ramp which meant decks E and G had to be loaded one after the other rather than at the same time. And the ramp couldn't be raised high enough to reach E deck. So the vessel had to take on ballast to lower the bow into the water, sinking the ship enough that the ramp could reach deck E. Because the ship could only load one deck at a time, only two deck officers were assigned for loading and unloading compared to three officers at Calais or Dover. And so the duties of the deck officers at Zeebrugge were organized differently from their duties at Calais. On the Dover to Calais run, the ships were manned by a complement of four officers, a master, two chief officers, and a second officer. But for the Dover to Zeebrugge route, only three officers were employed, a master, one chief, and a second officer. When the Herald took on the Zeebrugge service, the total complement of deck officers grouped into five shift rotations was reduced from 15 to 10 officers. The extra five crew were given positions elsewhere around the fleet. When the Herald returned to the Calais service, instead of its original extra five officers returning to the ship, Officers from ships undergoing maintenance were assigned to the Herald. Because of this system, most of the temporary officers only needed to cover a few duties. Their main concern was to get the ship loaded and to sail safely between Dover and Calais. 
they became less involved with inspecting equipment or organizing the vessel because that wasn't part of their duties. Which meant maintenance, safety checks, crew training and smooth running of the vessel all suffered. On the 6th of March 1987, towards the end of winter, the Herald starts loading in Zeebrugge Harbour. The Herald's ballast tanks at the bow are flooded to lower the bow while they load E-deck. At 17.40, E-deck loading is complete, so they transfer the ramp to G-deck. The chief officer orders the ballast tank to be pumped out to raise the bow. It'll take over an hour to pump out the water and bring the vessel back to its normal trim. The Friday night Seebrugge to Dover trip is fairly full. Many of the passengers on board are returning to Dover. The total passenger count is 459 people. With 80 crew members, the total headcount is 539 people listed in the ship's manifest. There are 81 cars, 3 coaches and 47 cargo trucks. The Herald is licensed to carry a total of 630 persons, including crew, so the passenger manifest is within the limits of the ship. But the ship is slightly overloaded by weight when you add up the fuel, water, the passengers and crew, plus the weight of the cars, trucks and coaches. Overloading like this is quite common and the captain even tells the shoreside management that they're overloaded. The last officer on deck is supposed to be assistant bosun Mark Stanley, and it's his responsibility to close the bow doors before the mooring lines are dropped. But Stanley's not on the deck. He went to his cabin for a short break after clearing the car deck when they arrived. When the harbour station's call is sounded and the ship's mooring lines are dropped, Stanley is still asleep in his cabin. Chief Officer Leslie Sable should now stay on deck to make sure the bow doors are closed or be relieved by Stanley, whichever happens first. But he needs to get to his harbour station on the bridge, so he leaves G-Deck with the bow doors still open. He's confident that the assistant bosun will soon return from his cabin. Terence Ailing, the first bosun, is the last person on deck, but it's not his responsibility to close the doors and he doesn't know that the chief officer has left or that the assistant bosun is absent from duty. In the wheelhouse, Captain David Lurie, the master of Herald of Free Enterprise, assumes the doors are already closed. From his position on the bridge, he can't see the doors. There's no indicator light in the wheelhouse to alert him to the problem, and Chief Officer Sable is supposed to warn him if there's a problem with the doors. But Sable doesn't mention anything. The crew of the Herald are under pressure to leave immediately. They're already five minutes behind schedule because of the longer loading procedure at Zeeburga. And there's pressure to turn the ship around quickly. The company sent a memo to the assistant manager dated the 18th of August 1986, which reads, Every effort has to be made to sail the ship 15 minutes earlier. I expect to read from now onwards. The ship left 15 minutes early. Put pressure on the first officer if you don't think he is moving fast enough. Let's put the record straight. Sailing late out of Zeebrugge isn't on. It's 15 minutes early for us. After completing the loading operations in Zeebrugge, the Herald begins its departure procedure. It starts to move away from number 12 berth at 18.05. It goes astern, out of the dock, then turns to starboard at the end of Kennedy Key. After completing its turn, it sails towards the harbour exit at a speed of 14 knots. The weather is good with a light easterly breeze and a small swell. At 18.24, slightly under 20 minutes after the engine start, the Herald passes the harbour's outer mole. The Herald is running late and Captain Lurie is eager to make up the lost time. He ignores the ship's speed restrictions which would prevent water from coming over the bow spade while the vessel is trimmed down at the bow. The Herald accelerates from 14 to 19 knots. The vessel's bow, which is already low in the water, plows deeper under the waterline, which increases the height of the bow wave. In the shallow water, the vessel experiences a force called squat. As water passes underneath the ship in shallow water, it's squeezed into a tighter space, and as the water speeds up, it creates a low pressure that sucks the ship down further. The ferry's bow is low in the water, and the squat effect pulls it deeper. With the bow doors open, icy seawater spills over the bow spade and flows into the main deck. 
Most ships are subdivided into watertight compartments, but a Roro ferry like the Herald has a vehicle deck that's one continuous open space. As the ferry accelerates, seawater flows through the length of the ship. The heavy water increases the weight in the ferry, pushing it far beyond its already overloaded limit. A layer of water floods the entire length of the main deck. As the ferry rocks gently from side to side in the light swell, the water follows the movement of the ferry. This phenomenon is called the free surface effect. The seawater accumulates on the left side of the vehicle deck, upsetting the ferry's balance. In a matter of seconds, the ferry lists 30 degrees to port. Then the water settles and the ship doesn't list any further. The captain and crew have only a moment to catch their breath before the Herald veers slightly to starboard under the weight of the water on board. Then it slowly settles into an almost 90 degree list. At 18.28, the Herald capsizes onto a sandbar with its starboard side above the surface. The sudden turn to starboard in the last moments and capsizing onto the sandbar prevents the Herald from sinking entirely into the deep water of the center channel. This sequence of events takes less than 90 seconds. The crew don't have time to make a mayday call, alert the passengers, lower the lifeboats or deploy life jackets. Water quickly overwhelms the ship's electrical systems and short circuits both the main and emergency power, plunging the ferry into darkness. It's high tide and the Herald is on its port side, half submerged in shallow water less than a mile from shore. The Belgian dredger Sanderis is dredging between the new and old mole on the western side of the channel. The crew notice the Herald veer to starboard, making a hard right turn almost perpendicular to the channel, then heel to port and list onto its left side and capsize onto the sandbank. 30 seconds later, the ferry's lights disappear. The Sanderis immediately notifies Port Control Zeebrugge on VHF while setting course for the scene of the accident. They report the bow doors appear to be wide open. The Sanderis is the first vessel to arrive on the scene and the crew immediately starts searching for survivors. On board the Herald, many of the people on the starboard or high side of the ship manage to clamber through the corridors and escape onto the side of the ferry. Others are submerged in freezing water without life jackets in pitch darkness. Some people are able to climb to safety, while others are left struggling to hold on amongst floating debris and bodies. Members of the crew who make it out onto the high side of the ferry realize there are passengers still trapped inside the ship. Their training has always focused on evacuating the ship with at least 30 minutes to launch lifeboats and disembark everyone safely. The crew aren't prepared for this scenario. Boson Ailing takes responsibility for organizing the rescue efforts. A crew rescue team goes inside the ferry to look for passengers who are still trapped. Another team waits outside the ferry and leads passengers to a temporary holding area and assists passengers while they wait for rescue to arrive. The first team goes to the bridge to check on the officers, then they make their way through the passenger spaces. They gain access by smashing windows on the top side of the ship. They lower ropes into the darkness below and haul passengers out of the water. The temperature of the sea in March is near freezing, so they're racing against the onset of hypothermia. The team inside the ferry search for anyone still alive. They have to act fast and decide quickly if an unconscious person is dead or alive. They sort the bodies, alive to the left and dead to the right. Anyone shouting is given priority. As they move through the watery hallways in darkness, the crew hear the voices of their colleagues crying for help. The only thing worse than hearing the crying is when the voices go silent. It doesn't take long for rescue services to arrive, but the Herald's crew stay on the wreck to help evacuate the passengers that are still alive. Crew members continue working until they collapse from exhaustion or are removed by the rescue services. Port Control Zeebrugge sends out a mayday relay requesting all vessels to assist. Nearby ferry vessels, tugboats, a crane barge and numerous small boats and fishing vessels arrive on the scene. They search the area for survivors. The row row vessel Gabriel Veer drops anchor just west of the wreck and prepares a helipad on its upper deck 
Then they opened their stern ramp to receive casualties. Belgian Air Force helicopters and Navy divers arrive at 1925. They coordinate the rescue operation, which includes naval vessels from England, the Netherlands and Germany. Police, fire and port emergency services stand by for survivors to be brought to shore. Fleets of ambulances stand ready to rush survivors to six hospitals on high alert. Red Cross volunteers from all walks of life rally to bring comfort to survivors and their relatives. The search continues into the early morning. At 0215, just after low tide, the rescuers begin a systematic search of the wreck. The tide is starting to turn. By 0245, the rapidly rising tide forces the rescue team to suspend the search and resume during daylight when the tide starts to recede. Most of the victims still trapped inside the ship die from hypothermia in the near freezing water. Despite the Coast Guard, Navy and civilian rescue efforts, over a third of the people on board don't make it out alive. 193 lives are lost, including half the crew of 80 people. Most of the victims are British citizens. Almost all die from drowning or hypothermia. Towards the end of April 1987, the Herald was refloated and towed to a yard in Flissingen Harbour in the Netherlands. The first plan was to repair the vessel and return it to service, but no buyer could be found, so the Herald was sold for scrap metal. The Townsend Torreson branding was painted over for its final voyage to a scrapyard in Taiwan. In October 1987, the jury at the coroner's inquest came out with 187 verdicts of unlawful killing. Seven people employed by the company were charged with gross negligence manslaughter, and the operating company P&O European Ferries was charged with corporate manslaughter. But the case collapsed when the judge directed the jury to acquit the company and the five most senior defendants. The Merchant Shipping Act of 1979 states that it's not an offence for a Roro ferry to go to sea with its bow doors open. Since then, several improvements to the design of this type of vessel have been put into regulations. Indicators on the bow show if the bow doors are open, watertight ramps fit into the bow sections at the front of the ship, and freeing flaps that allow water to escape from the vehicle deck. In 1990, the regulations for the height between the vehicle deck and the waterline was raised from 76 centimeters to 125 centimeters for all new Roro ships. Some vessels have completely removed the bow door configuration and only use a rear door design. New international maritime organization regulations are in place that prohibit an open, undivided deck of this length on a passenger Roro vessel. Both of the Herald's two sister ships operated for almost two decades before being retired from service and scrapped in 2012 and 2015.